three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Equity Committee for Thursday, June 16th, 2022. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Fass, please call the role of board members to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Scott. Present. Dr. Hager. Ms. Jose. Present. Ms. Rowe. Mr. Thomas. Here. Thank you. And it looks like someone mentioned something in the chat. Oh, it looks like, um, let's see. Dr. Hager is here. I guess if you could call her name again. Sure. Dr. Hager. Hmm. If you're there, Dr. Hager, I think you're muted. Okay, well, we can't hear her, so. All right, well, we'll see um, if she joins us um, later. So Ms. Fast, could you please call and note the names of any additional staff members participating in the meeting? Sure, the committee members I believe are Dr. Yarborough and uh, Mr. Handy. Present. Okay. Is Dr. Yarborough present as well? Okay. Doesn't look like it. Okay. Um, are there any members um, or any uh, staff participating on the call that we've not named? There's uh, Miss Anderson. Good evening. Miss Lagerman. Good evening. Miss Lowry. Present. Mr. McCall. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any board members present that um, we've not named? Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, so um, the next item is, or the first item is um, system improvement, team recruitment and retention. And for that, I call on Mr. Doug Handy um, with a presentation by Ms. Lowry and Mr. McCall. All right, thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, so this evening, um, as stated, I'm very excited to have a presentation on was from the recruitment and retention system-wide improvement team and this is one of a series of system-wide improvement teams that Dr. Williams had put in motion and um, again this evening and really at the request of our equity committee members we wanted to get an update on um, recruitment and retention specifically so we do have staff um, from uh, human resources and we also have Ms. Lagerman um, because they uh, come together, Ms. Lagerman, Ms. Lowry, and Mr. McCall actually are the uh, co-facilitators, if you will, of the system-wide improvement team. And then we have uh, Ms. Anderson here as well, our uh, Chief Human Resources Officer. So at this point, um, I will turn it over to them. Ms. Anderson, I don't know if you want to make any remarks before we hear from the uh, system-wide improvement team. So I'll turn it over to you if you have anything you want to share. No, I don't have anything, Doug. I'm here to support HR. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to our presenters for this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, appreciate this opportunity to, to be with you this evening and um, share with you some of the work that we have um, been examining as part of the system-wide improvement team. So next slide, please. 
So um, some of you I'm sure are familiar with uh, the blueprint for Maryland's future. Uh, part of the blueprint requires for school systems across the state to evaluate its hiring practices to determine if those pr practices are contributing to a lack of diversity amongst our teaching workforce. As an outgrowth of this review, we would need to make the appropriate adjustments to our hiring practices and then report um, any, in, any of the findings to MSDE. Next slide. Part of the review of our hiring practices will include an examination of the work we've outlined within the compass under goal three, high performing workforce and alignment of human capital. For key initiative one, recruitment source and partnerships, we've identified three key um, strategies that we wanted to focus on. Defining quality measures of success and build success monitoring tools for tracking effectiveness and recruitment sources and methods. Um, building an interim tracking system um, in order to increase the number of interns who've become new hires in Baltimore County and expand our professional development schools, especially partnerships with HBCUs, which provide college internships and with a focus on high need schools. So as you can see, much of what we have um, outlined um, is also part of the initiative from the blueprint as far as examining some of those hiring practices. And part of our current review and examination of those hiring practices will include a comprehensive and longitudinal analysis of staffing trends. It will include an audit of recruitment, interview and selection practices. It will include a comparative student and staff demographic analysis, and it will include a stakeholder input from both par um, participants in uh, district practices and processes related to new hires. Next slide, please. Some of the key highlights within the blueprint include um, a definition of diversity. So the, the recommendation that we received from a work group um, outlined for us the pathway that we should take uh, when we examine our hiring practices. And part of that included a definition for diversity, identifying staff demographics that reflect student demographics. And while the pr primary focus um, is racial and ethnic identification, um, our review should also note that diversity encompasses individuals who identify as LGBTQ and individuals with disabilities. A uh, pipe, pipeline of diverse educators is another area um, that we need to examine as part of the, um, the blueprint. And so those challenges addressed in the latest Maryland teacher staffing report um, have uh, been exacerbated by COVID, as you can imagine. Uh, recommendations at the state, county, and local level with reference to um, teacher prep and certification and interim programming and loan forgiveness. These are three areas that this work group recommended in their report to the state as areas that the state should consider. Factors in evaluation of hiring practices, specific guidelines for LEAs to evaluate hiring practices um, is the area that we will focus on um, in our report back to MSDE, which is due on July 1. Next slide. So as part of our evaluation and report back uh, to MSDE, the work group listed the factors that are on this slide. These are the recommendations that came from this voluntary work group. It was organized to address the evaluation of hiring practices as outlined in the blueprint. And you can see that they recommended seven factors. So staffing trends, recruitment practices, interview practices, selection practices, comparison of the student population to the staff population, and survey data from two stakeholder groups, one being new hires 
and the second being any individuals within the system that participate in that screening process for teachers. Number seven identifies local localized or unique challenges. This was listed as optional, but it is something that our SIT team has been working on to try to pull back um, the, the layers, so to speak, and hear from some of our stakeholders uh, to un better understand what are some, some challenges that might be unique to Baltimore County. Um, is the, the layout and makeup of Baltimore County with unique communities, um, we are we are a large county and from you know one end of our horseshoe to the other um, we have um, unique communities embedded within so we want to um, examine that to see if there's anything that might um, come as a challenge to a school in one area that might not be a challenge to a school in another area and so th those challenges would then be outlined in this section next slide please Um, again, most of you, um, hopefully all of you are very familiar with our compass and um, in 2018 2019 during that school year baseline data was established within the compass for uh, teacher workforce by race. Um, in addition, target goals were established for years three, five and eight as you see outlined here. Next slide please. So on, on this slide, what you're going to see is from the, the bottom where you see October 2021 and it's highlighted in yellow all the way across. You will see that by October 2021. As a system, we have met the targeted goals outlined in the compass. We are currently working with draw at this time. Uh, to reestablish and re-examine these targets because we've met the three, five, and eight year target. And if you look um, in that center column, we've exceeded that five year target um, within that center um, column for our white population of, of teachers um, based on the goals that were established. So at this point, um, the goals that are established when the, in the compass, again, we have to revisit those so that um, each year between um, moving forward this upcoming year and 2029, 20, uh, we would have new targets then that we would try to achieve. Next slide. Um, on this slide, you will see student versus school based employees. This is our demographics that is broken down by race. On the, on the slide on the left, you will see our student enrollment by race. Um, as you can see for um, this school year alone, 2021-2022, if you take a look at our black population of students at 40.37% compared to if you go to the far right, the, the slide on the right, shows you school based employees by race and ethnicity. And if you look at 2021, 2022, you will see 13.84% of our school based employees are black. So we are trying to close that gap so that we have um, a closer comparison between our student population and our school based educator population. Next slide, please. So on this slide, you will see a map of Baltimore County, and this goes back to that number seven, factor number seven on that previous slide um, that asks what localized or unique challenges should be considered that impact our ability as a school system to increase diversity through recruiting, hiring and our ability to retain a diverse workforce. This was the question that we proposed to our um, system improvement team and we generated a lot of conversation um, during the time that we spent on this particular slide. Um, as an outgrowth of this, um, Mr. Handy and I um, met with some principals earlier this week, I believe it was Tuesday, um, to have a discussion about 
our principals needing a space to be able to engage in conversation to address this very question and what they can do to support and help each other and creating that space where they can have open and, and honest dialogue about what some of those challenges are that they face and what they have done within their own schools and in within their own communities to try to break down some of these barriers that sometimes stand in the way of us being able to move forward to create um, a more diverse workforce. Next slide, please. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. McCall. Thank you, Maria. To continue with the topic of localized and unique challenges in BCPS as it relates to recruitment and retention, our historically black colleges and universities, particularly Morgan State University, has expressed interest in forming partnerships in our central area schools. By doing this, they're looking to provide their teacher interns with a more diverse experiences. While schools on the west side of the county are very interested in expanding more partnerships with HBCUs. And some of you may have heard that the best recruitment plan is to have a good retention plan. During our system improvement team meetings, we discuss the education trust report through our eyes. This report provides a glimpse into the experiences of a few black teachers from across the country. Many of the experiences articulated in this report reflects some of the past and current practices even here in BCPS. For example, teachers taking on extra duties because of unique strengths were additionally taxed or burdened with their res these responsibilities. Teachers being frustrated for being pigeonholed or relegated to positions as disciplinarians. The feeling of being denied or overlooked for new opportunities in other schools or roles to maintain a diversity quota in their current positions. And teachers of color is not feeling seen or safe to share their own experiences in the system. Next slide, please. So why does this matter when black teachers represent a small fraction of the workforce, not only in BCPS, but also nationwide? Well, it matters because black teachers make up a small fraction of the teacher workforce while there's an inverse relationship with that of student demographics. It's not because black teachers can't or don't want to teach. They're often faced with discrimination and stereotyping that leaves them feeling alienated from the school community and therefore impacting their ability to be effective and hence affecting their desire to remain in the profession. Building a diverse teacher workforce is not an easy, easy job. It's about more than just increasing the numbers of black teachers in a given school or school system. It's also about understanding the intricate and nuanced nature of the black teacher experiences. It's our belief that understanding and being supportive of the black teacher experiences would not only help to diversify teacher workforce, but also help in building and retaining a workforce that is more representative of its student population, which is becoming increasingly more diverse. Next slide, please. Previously, I touched upon our partnerships with HBCUs. But what are some of the things we in HR are doing to continue in our efforts to diversify our teacher workforce? In this slide, we take a critical look at school cultures and systemic processes. And this slide just shows a sample of the hiring and onboarding questions we're using to garner a new hire's perspective on diversity to help inform us on responsive placement and to help eliminate bias in hiring and onboarding in our processes. Some of the questions we ask, what topics did you cover in your interviews? And on a Likers scale, how strongly do you agree with the following statements? The students at my school are diverse in terms of race. The teachers at my school are diverse in terms of race. The non-instructional staff at my school are diverse in terms of race. The racial diversity of the staff matches the racial diversity of the students at my school. And most students at my school have a teacher the same race as them. Next slide, please. On this slide, we continue to take a critical examination of school cultures and systemic processes. We turn to focus group topic areas 
to gain new educator perspective data. The focus group topic areas include belonging, how much educators feel that they are valued members of the school community. Cultural awareness and action, how well a school supports educators in learning about discussing and confronting air issues of race, ethnicity and culture. And then the last topic here, professional learning, perceptions of the quantity and quality of professional learning opportunities available to educators. Now I'd like to turn the presentation over to Heather Lagerman. We'll discuss next steps as it relates to our recruitment and retention for our system improvement team. Heather. Thank you very much, Homer. So as you'll see on this slide, uh, we have created some key initiatives and some strategy areas, and we've been meeting in small work groups as well as as a larger team. And for key initiative one is the recruitment source and partnerships section. And we've mapped out, as you can see, uh, summer, fall and spring goals. Um, and the first one for summer 22 we're really excited about is creating a BCPS guide to equitable interview processes. And that's something um, that clearly is going to be serving a great purpose for us um, throughout our system, and our whole team is collaborating on that. Um, in addition, for summer 22, working on reviewing recruitment practices and identifying those that are, are contributing to our lack of diversity. And then in fall, moving on to reviewing the selection processes for our BCPS schools and offices and looking at revising our recruitment plan with those with that lens in mind, as well as soliciting feedback uh, on the, the interview process, the placement process, utilizing that stakeholder survey to reduce bias in the interview and placement process. And then in spring 23, uh, shifting to also looking at demographic student demographic data and putting that comparatively alongside the placement of educators in schools, as well as supporting school leaders uh, with looking at intentionality in their staffing decisions for diversity when building schedules as well as creating classes. And then in the next slide for Kia Initiative 2, you'll see that that focuses on teacher retention and reduction of vacancies. And our goals for that for summer is to examine the trends and critical data points from surveys and also from focus groups that point towards larger trends that we have in attrition, particularly for our non tenured teachers. And also then in fall and spring, really looking at creating crossover and looking at how to better collaborate and a process for taking all of the supports we have, consulting teachers, staff development teachers, peer advisors and department chairs, and really integrating and aligning support for new educators in an easily digestible format for both principals to provide the support and for new educators to access it. And then the other piece is inventorying and analyzing professional developments and all those supports that we have in place once again so that it's easy to understand to ensure that we are looking at creating systems and structures so that new teacher support coaching cycles all of that makes sense for meeting the individualized needs of our educators so that everyone can get what they need and then i think we're going to open it up for questions Sorry, I was on mute. Wow, I was still reading. <laughs> that was awesome. Oh, I know, and I know it's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so very much. That was um, exceptional. I I I found that um, uh, uh, very intriguing. Um, since this is his last meeting, I'll start with Christian. <laughs> if you have anything to say, if you're still processing it, I can go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am still processing that. That was definitely a lot. I, I want to say thank you so much. This seems like. Uh, I, I'm loving that there is a uh, localized unique that we're recruiting from uh, or expanding our HBCU partnerships that we can start to recruit from there. Um, I'm loving the creation of an equitable interview process, the guide. I think that is so incredible. Um, I guess one of my questions is, you know, what do you think the biggest barrier is right now in in retaining our our diverse workforce? And what have you kind of from from this work, those biggest barriers that you've found so far. Well, um, I also want to make sure um, Doug is included in this conversation too. He um, he helps us with uh, a lot of our planning and a lot of the, the work that that we do. Um, I will I will tell you the, the one thing that um, I think that we hear most frequently um, is that uh, oftentimes 
the the teacher doesn't feel like they have that partner within the school. So if they are a new hire um, teacher of color and there is not um, another teacher of color in that building, they feel isolated and they feel like they don't have a partner that they can um, go to and have engage in conversation um, just to sometimes just check in and, and am I am I going about something the right way? Am I am I hearing this correctly um, to get some of that guidance and mentorship? So a lot of what um, Doug has been doing with with his um, team is what what can we do to support and provide um, uh, guidance and access uh, for all of the teachers that that we hire, but most especially for those teachers uh, of color that are beginning with our system and may feel like they don't they don't have that that resource. So um, another piece for us from HR to try to address that is working on how can we create this almost like hiring buddy system so that um, it's much easier when you're going to a a new school for the very first time and you're going with somebody that either you may know or may be stepping into that new situation at the same time right alongside you. Um, so we're examining some some of those opportunities as well. Um, Doug, did you want to talk a little bit about um, some of the things that um, have been worked on and, and discussed as far as affinity groups? Sure. Yep. Thank you, uh, Ms. Lowry. Appreciate that. So, um, in line with what Ms. Lowry mentioned, uh, so I guess we had some affinity groups we started around curriculum writing, um, but most recently we took, in partnership really with uh, Ms. Lagerman's group, it's called the Teacher of Color Self Care Series. It was actually started by three uh, teachers, three black female teachers, um, who saw this need to create a more supportive environment for starting teachers, just like Ms. Lowry mentioned. And they created this series and that series was very popular. So they talked about, you know, just how do you get started in your career? What are the supports that are available? Um, it went into like leadership opportunities, how to prepare for leadership or how to prepare for other uh, opportunities within the district. And coming out of that, we heard uh, last year, the first year, we continued again this year. We had some outstanding teachers that helped to uh, lead the series. Our Maryland Teacher of the Year, Brianna Ross, co-facilitated with a teacher, uh, Alteric Dunstan, who is, a, a, I think he's a department chair, he's, he's a, a STEM teacher, uh, tech and engineering down at Hollabird. So he came in, the two of them did the series together. And coming out of that, a lot of the teachers said they wanted to continue. So they wanted an affinity group because, you know, just like Ms. Lowry mentioned, depending on the makeup of their building, the staff makeup, they could be maybe the only teacher of color or not have a connection with fellow teachers. So we talked about setting up affinity groups either within schools or more likely across schools so teachers could, you know, have that sense of community across schools and help support them along the way. So um, we started doing some planning to re-energize a group called The Collective that started around curriculum writing. So we're looking to bring that back um, to give um, our teachers of color a space where they can be, you know, a part of an affinity space. And then really trying to open it up based on whatever identity a teacher may have making sure that each teacher has a sense of community around the identity or identities that, you know, um, that they value and that they feel like they need an additional community around. So um, that's really what we learned this year. If you look at the challenges teachers have faced, so we're really gearing up to have some um, affinity groups in space in place for next year. And again, we partner with my department and then with, uh, you know, Heather's department and, you know, Ms. Anderson's division and working with Ms. Lowry and Mr. Call. So, a lot, lot of partnerships across um, units, if you will, to make sure teachers are supported uh, really from the start and hoping that, you know, Mr. McCall mentioned, we help to retain all teachers and, you know, particular attention to teachers of color and needs that they may have along the way. Thank you. And so, I mean, I, I've been around to all of our middle schools and high schools around the county, you know, interacting with our students and our, and our teachers there. And I've noticed some trends in some of our schools where we do have some of our schools, you know, do have a, a, a larger population of BIPOC teachers and, and and engage in the school, and some of our schools do not. And I, I I look at my school, for example, Eastern Tech, and I think I can count on one hand the number of Black teachers that we have 
but I couldn't even count the number of white teachers that we have in our school. So I think that this work is is really incredible to try to change that and to begin to to uh, move that along. I also really love the hiring and onboarding. Uh, the how do you strongly do you agree with the following statements one the questions I love that um, it not only refers to the number of teachers and students in the staff that are are diverse in terms of race but also the non-instructional staff um, because we can kind of have a single narrative as to you know which racial group is 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 more prevalent in in different instructional and in the instructional classroom versus like the custodial class part of, of a school environment and I think that's really something we have to uh, break down as well um, in our school. So I think this work is really incredible and I'm excited. I, I'm excited that we've been increasing in terms of, of reflecting our diversity in the teacher workforce with that of our students over the years and um, maybe one day there will be an exponential increase and and so that, that we can see that. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for that Mr. Thomas. Yeah, those are definitely good points. Um, I'll just jump in there real quick and then Ms. Jose will be next. Um, <clears throat> I was just looking at the numbers um, from the chart you pulled up where it says that our teaching staff teachers are, um, as of this past year, 81% uh, white, 5.92% other race, and 12.99% black. And that's like an increase. Whereas we have 40.37% black students. And um, it says the school based educator population is um, only 13.4% black. So that's interesting as we look at things on the board, children are not seeing themselves reflected not only in um, literature and, 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 and textbooks and things, but they're also not seeing themselves reflected at school among staff. Um, and what I wanted to know is, is that equivalent to the national average or these numbers higher? than the national average? Um, we don't we don't have those specific numbers with us tonight. Um, that's a good question. And what we we might be able to do is then um, set our numbers up against the state overall and then against national numbers just so that um, it really it would be a good way to put it kind of in perspective. But um, I, I, do, I do think um, there would be, if you, if you isolated certain sections across um, the United States, there would probably be, um, you know, isolated states, isolated districts that would be different, just like here within, mm -hmm. within the state of Maryland. But I think um, to see it for, again, our comparison to, um, the state of Maryland in general, and then the the national average. Um, I think it it would be good to see how we compare. I think that would be great to see, mm -hmm. as well as not only just the national average, but counties in Maryland that are comparable to ours. Mm -hmm. Because obviously, if the population of students can uh, show that we have a, a very diverse population, student body, and parents, then assuming uh, that the teachers also, you know, live in the state of Maryland, which I'm sure they all do. Um, that's not reflected in our workforce. And based on what I've seen is it looks like D BCPS has a diverse student body population, but we do not really have a diverse workforce. Mm -hmm. OK, yeah, that's my assessment. I just wanted to um, see if that was correct. So, yeah, that follow up with that information. Um, would be great because I think following up with that, but then also letting us know how it's being implemented over the summer and hiring and recruitment and then coming back to us probably um, at the end of the summer or maybe at our September meeting and um, giving us that feedback and um, what these efforts, how they manifest and what impact it had. That would be great. Thank you. Um, let's see. Looks like Miss Jose. Yes, Ms. thank you. Um, just one quick question. Thank you for the presentation. Do we have a breakdown of what is the percent of black male teachers in BCPS overall? Um, we don't have it for you tonight, but we do have that. Um, it It is um, in our 
in the overall report that we will um, present to MSDE. So yes, we can include that um, in a future update for you. And you don't have a ballpark figure of what percentage are males overall, regardless of ethnicity in um, BCPS at the top of your head? Um, I don't I don't want to tell you the wrong number, um, but I. I will tell you it's low. OK, and then the percent of black males would be even lower based on that yes. number. Okay, if you could get get that um, number to us, that would be great. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Jose. Uh, next is Dr. Hager. And then Ms. Yes, Thomas. thank you for the. Um, can, can you hear me OK? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Um, sorry, I was having internet issues earlier. Um, thank you for the presentation and for all the work that you're doing on this important initiative. Um, my question kind of piggybacks, piggybacks on what Ms. Scott was talking about, about other counties in Maryland, and um, referring to your slide about geographic um, issues that we have within the county, I would add, you know, the fact that we are surrounded by other counties. And so, into place are I know similar to several of the other counties in Maryland. This is something that's within the blueprint. And so I would just um, ask, you know, are we collaborating with other counties? Are we um, doing things that are different that you know of that are that set us apart from our surrounding counties? You know, living in Catonsville, I know many people who teach in Anne Arundel and Howard and Baltimore City and kind of the, the other areas around us. So um uh, I'll let Mr. McCall chime in on this one as well, but um, we do stay connected with our hiring partners, um, most especially with the counties that are similar to us in size. So um, PG County, Montgomery County, um, even, even um, some of the practices like with Anne Arundel County, um, we collaborate. There's a two times a year when um, there are representatives from HR, from um, all the LEAs that get get together um, to talk about anything that's new um, coming down the pipe with regard to legislation about certification requirements, um, hiring practices, et cetera. So um, things like uh, we use, um, we have a vendor called Handshake that we use to reach out to applicants at the college level. Um, our um, Frontline is what we use for our um, application process. Howard County, Carroll County um, also use this. So um, we are often collaborating with them about how we can adjust and tweak this tool um, to be more efficient and to, to, to have a better outreach um, to candidates. Uh, we also, um, you know, oftentimes um, there are some recruitment events that are better attended than others or that are more diverse than others. Um, and so we we share a lot with each other as far as, yeah, we just went to this particular um, event, wouldn't necessarily recommend it, it wasn't very well attended versus we went to this event for the first time and we saw tons of people. So we do share that type of, of, of information with each other to get a sense of what's working. We've collaborated with um, Anne Arundel County, for example, with our recruitment efforts with um, Puerto Rico. Um, Anne Arundel County has been um, going, um, reaching out to Puerto Rico for recruitment for a number of years. So we um, refreshed and, and revitalized what we were doing with those efforts based upon what we had heard from Anne Arundel County. Um, Anne Arundel County, um, PG County, um, Baltimore County, we all have diversity fairs and um, one year something may be working really well and the next year it's not. So we we do collaborate with each other to see um, how how are we getting more traffic, um, and and where are they um, being success? But you know, seeing more success, um, and we share the same thing with them. So we really are all in this together. Um, so we we do really um, try to coordinate and help each other through this process. 
Great. I'm sorry, did I cut someone off? I apologize. I, I just I passed it to Mr. McCall just in case he had anything additional to share. Oh, yes, uh, sir. That's all right. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Thank you, Maria. Um, Maria, I think you really nailed a lot of those things that we are collaborating on, but the other thing is to do is just to go in a little bit about the Handshake um, um, platform that we use. Handshake is a huge tool when we're at the, uh, we attended the National Association of Colleges and Employers uh, conference. It was a virtual conference. We found out that many of the college campuses uh, required that their freshmen uh, register uh, during freshman orientation uh, to their Handshake accounts. So we use that tool to go in and sort of proactively recruit uh, at these various colleges, universities, not only HBCUs, but also just across the country in general, uh, to those students where we can just sort of filter out, if you will, be very targeted about our, um, uh, our population that we're trying to get to. Uh, whether or not it's folks who are education majors. And as you know, we probably, we've hired more anesthetists across the country, more conditional teachers, looking at folks who are math, science, uh, English majors, who are not traditional teacher education programs, but then they're looking to come into education. So we're targeting those individuals through that handshake application to get out to those individuals specifically and say, hey, this is what we have for Baltimore County, what we can offer you. Now, we are uh, one uh, 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 school system, which I don't think really uh, many of the others have that platform or that premium platform that we use. Um, and uh, it's sort of an advantage for us to be able to get to those individuals prior to anyone else uh, um, actually recruiting them. So it, that's one of the things, of course, we have in our arsenal of tools, if you will. Uh, we, you know, of course, we do collaborate, but then sometimes we rather for them to also find about us doing those things in the community on social media. So we've already gotten to them. You know, we're out in the community trying to do. We're starting to look at doing more things, uh, not only just on the college campuses outside of those virtual fairs, or even in person. Now they're moving more, more back, well, back to the in-person fairs. But not just those particular job fairs going into the classroom, doing classroom visits, uh, doing community events. Uh, we're looking to do chat and choose with uh, a number of our different ca uh, communities as well as on college, college campuses. So we're doing some things differently. I think I heard that as part of your question uh, that we're trying to um, use as our recruitment uh, uh, arsenal, if you will, uh, moving forward. So some things we're doing differently. Then, of course, uh, there are some things we do, as Ms. Uh, Lowry did mention to you, on uh, collaborating with the other school systems. So thank you for that. Mr. McCall, mm -hmm. can you also yes. mention your, your recent community um, outreach event? So the one with the Morning Star Baptist Church? Yes, so we were re represented at Morning Star Baptist Church. Uh, it was a nicely attended event. Uh, that was on the 14th, I believe. My days run together now, especially when we're in the summer in the peak of our uh, hiring season. Um, but we did have representatives from BCPS there at the Morning Star Baptist Church uh, on the west side of the uh, the county and um, had quite a bit of traffic to come through. I think it was over maybe 40 employers who were there for that event. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, that was on the west side. I actually um, went. I went over to that, and I saw there were two BCPS big trucks. I think. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Great. Yeah. yeah. We were on the inside too at the table too. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. All <Great>. right. <laughs> all right. Thank you for that, Ms. Scott. All right. Wonderful. And let's see. We had a question from Mr. Thomas. Thank you. So. Um, if we go back to slide 11, uh, there's a a map of Baltimore County, and it it uh, I'm wondering what does the SRC mean on that map? It, it's the blue shaded area. It says FTE is greater than or equal to 115% of SRC. Heather, did you provide this map to? To Allison, I think this came from a. I did not. Yeah, I did not. I can look. Yeah, I. Th I think that she pulled this map 
because it was clear. It represents all of the high schools on here. OK, um, and I can't the legend at the bottom is so small that I can't I can't. Oh wait, it's a state rated capacity. OK, yeah, I knew it was on there somewhere, but I couldn't I couldn't see it. Gotcha. What does state rated capacity mean? So I, I think that that's um, related to the I think these are the um, related to the sizes of these schools. Oh, OK, OK. That so makes, you oh, see, sorry. yeah, yeah, because those those see the, the blue. Yeah, so it isn't referring to the uh, thank you, the Roman class. It isn't referring no, it's the, to yeah, it's the um, the facility size, the yeah. maximum okay. number of students that can be accommodated in the facility. Yep. Yeah. OK, thank you so much. Um, all right, my question is, so when we're looking back at the at the data on slide 10 that's showing the student versus school based employee demographics, you know, in some of our schools we have we have a very diverse system, right? But in some of our schools on uh, Newtown High School, for example, I think it's 99 percent minority versus Hereford High School being 11 percent minority. Um, my question is for our diverse staff is is that kind of the same thing are we having large concentrations of of, of our black teachers in, in one school and, and not spread around the county or would you say that um and, and other and other uh bipoc groups or would you say that for staff it's this is a representation of like like if i was to go to you know any of our high schools would i kind of see this breakdown of 80 13 7 you know so and so forth or would it be like similar to our high school demographics in that way and for students. I I think you would have. Um, if you do, if you look at the demographics um, school by school, mm -hmm. you will have some schools where the demographics for the students and the staff are more in line. Um, and then you're going to have a larger number of schools where it's more like this. It's it's off. It's it's not balanced. So um, going school by school, you can then really identify the schools where we have more work to do um, mm -hmm. as far as what what can we do to to bring more diversity within the building with the staff. Um, and again, you'll find schools that are almost a perfect balance across the school um, and then um, even though their their balance as far as the staff is concerned it still may not be representative um, in comparison to the student demographics and then you're going to have some schools where the student demographics and the staff demographics um, almost mirror one another so um, it, it's just it, it you have to look at it a, a across the system and it's not necessarily um, an elementary middle high school um, as far as it's it's more balanced in one level than another. Um, okay. It's just it there are there are specific schools where there is a better balance. OK, and my, my question is, are you looking at all 175 schools kind of the breakdown there and then I, for the choosing the teachers that are in each school, I know the principals play a part in that role. So mm -hmm. as a part of the principal professional development or training to incorporate, you know, looking at their data right now and, and using that as, as a baseline to try to improve diversity. Yeah, so um, you are correct. The principals play a huge role um, in that. And um, what you just described is some of the work um, that, that we have um, lined up with um, Mr. Handy, um, because this is it's a collaborative process. It, it's it doesn't belong to the principal 100 percent, doesn't belong to um, Mr. Handy's shop 100 percent, HR 100 percent. Everyone um, has to play a role in this because if you go back to what um, Mr. McCall said, he he's on a, a recruiting trip out of state. Right. That's where that you know it it it's it's starting there but it's even starting back to handshake and and to be honest it's starting back to the kindergarten mm -hmm. so we we have to as a system continue our work on showcasing what it means to be an educator mm -hmm. 
if if you think about um, the time that you've spent in our system, you've probably heard a lot about um, STEM and um, what is available to you as a student in that in that field. We have to do a better job at marketing what it means to be an educator and what those possibilities are for students in the future to become educators and to become educators with Baltimore County Public Schools because what better place could you start that career and end your career as an educator than coming to Baltimore County Public Schools? So um, we, we have to work on how we can showcase our system um, as a place that you want to come and grow and learn and, and become the strongest educator you can be um, with us and with this team of, of Team Beat CPS. So um, that work starts in the kindergarten classroom and those connections and that's why it's so important to have a better balance here because you as a student you want to see that that teacher you want to see yourself in that teacher mm -hmm. so um it's building those connections from kindergarten all the way through and so what what can we do to change these um the the, the demographics of our workforce so that it does mirror our students but also at the same time um, showcasing the positives about being an educator. Thank you. Miss Connie asked one more question. Yep, one more. OK, one more. My last question of the equity committee. Um, it <laughs> is you mentioned um, LGBTQ plus recruitment, I believe a little bit earlier. I was at Deer Park Magnet Middle School last Friday meeting with their um, their their GSA, their Gender Sexuality Alliance group, and their teacher. Their, they have a non binary teacher in their school. And I remember the students were just, they were like, this is the first non-binary teacher I've ever had in my entire life. And I feel comfortable now using they, them pronouns um, in the school. And they were all in that club, they were all wearing the pride flags to represent themselves. Um, and so I'm wondering what are the some of the recruitment efforts you shared, um, how you're going to HBCUs uh, and, and other things, but what are some of the recruitment efforts for LGBTQ plus staff? You know, I, I think that that, that really begins um, across our system. Um, what we have have heard from applicants when we have um, been engaged in the recruitment process is they're looking at our web page. They're looking at our social media. They're looking to see does our school system community accept them? Does our school system community invite them? Do they see themselves in what we are posting on social media in our school wide events? Um, are they seeing that there is an opportunity for them um, in our system because they um, they see events, they see things that students are doing, they see what we are promoting as a system. So um, again, I think that we all own that. So we have to. Um, you know, uh, we we have to make sure that it is part of. All, all of our, our efforts in our everyday communication, and it's not just in isolation. It's not a day. It's not a month. It's not a week. It's all the time and it's woven throughout everything that we do. Great. Thank you for thank that. You so yeah, no, thank you for that. And I think those are uh, some good points, and especially um, like Ms. Lowry was saying, even if someone doesn't want to self-identify like that, but they still feel welcomed in, and and still feel like this is where where they want to be, regardless. So, um, my my only other question is, is I would just wanted to follow up on one thing where um, Christian had spoke to as far as the principals um, that they are ultimately the ones who do the hiring at their schools and um, the principals. Um, I guess I'm wondering if it would be fair to say maybe do the hiring for based on their preference of, you know, maybe who they work with or who they feel they can work with. And I and that's human nature. I just wanted to know what, if anything, um, and this might be Mr. Handy or if it's like the area superintendents um, or in the past or in the future, what, if anything, are you all doing to disrupt that pattern? Are the hiring practices of the principals being looked at or as they're doing hiring, presumably now over the summer, um, as applications come to them, looking at um, what is being pushed forward, how it's being done and approving it and looking at the diversity of the final staff that 
are chosen at that school. Is someone as they're getting their training and as they're, um, like you said, being taught certain things on how to be more, I, I guess, inclusive, is someone from the equity office or another office working and sitting directly and looking at those hiring practices, and those applications that um, you all are actively going out and getting to ultimately see who is ultimately offered the position? Ms. Lowry, I don't know, but I'll comment briefly, Ms. Mm -hmm. Scott, and then I'll ask Ms. Lowry and team to comment. So I would, and I know you, you asked specifically about teachers. I will tell you, uh, my team and I have not been as involved with, with teacher selection. Uh, I am happy to report, you know, the other day at the board meeting when uh, I think it was 37 administrative appointments. If you looked at the principals in particular and some of the assistant principals, um, I will tell you that um, I was involved in several panels, members of my team, so um, good to know that we're a part of that process. I've talked to Ms. Lowry and Mr. McCall. We've had ongoing discussions around even the questions that are used in the hiring process for administrators. Uh, Ms. Lagerman and I and members of her team, we have some plans we've been working on along with Ms. Lowry and with our Department of Schools around um, administrators and leadership. So a lot of the work that I've been involved with and my team at this point around hiring a staff has really been focused more at the leadership level. Um, and I believe there's some things that we are learning and some practices that we're putting in place that we certainly can apply to hiring of teaching staff. And then we do have our general, uh, we call it engage wide equity, our, 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 and, you know, our system wide equity training um, that right now, you know, principals and other staff can opt into really to help folks have a better understanding of, you know, why equity is the focus of the school system and how that, uh, brings in diversity and inclusion. Uh, but I understand your question as far as like, you know, you said that data tracking and changing practice for hiring of teachers. Um, my department hasn't been involved in that just yet, but I think with what we're doing so far with HR and um, our, you know, um, organizational effectiveness and leadership, uh, we will be getting to that point, I believe, um, along the way. But I'll, I'll turn it over to Ms. Lowry. For, for, Thank you. For You're welcome. Yeah, I, I would agree with everything that um, Mr. Handy just outlined. I, I think um, for a while our, our, our focus has has really been um, at a broader level on what is our overall, what, what are the overall demographics of our system? What are the overall demographics of, of individual schools or students, et cetera? But you really do have to peel that back and see what it means at the individual school level and you have to to think about the why um you know why why does the data look the way that it does and how did we get here and some of that has been um work that mr mccall has done um during this last quarter of the year he's paid um he's he's been tracking some data on um the uh individuals that have been brought to the, essentially to the table to help with screening. And, um, you know, when, when you establish screening panels, um, sometimes you're, you're scheduling screening panels and you're reaching out to the people who have always been involved, but have you really looked at who's always been involved? So you've got to break it down by race, by gender, by level, what, what does that data tell you? So if you're always bringing white females to the table, um, does, does that give you that broad scope and spectrum of experiences um, that would enable you to reach out and really bring in um, a more diverse workforce? So um, we are examining that. The other piece that we have been um, examining, this was um, something that um, we have um, had in place for a little bit over a year now, um, paying closer attention to when we have interview panels, um, who's on that panel um, as far as diversity of experience, again, race, gender, ethnicity, like what is what does that panel tell us across the board um, so that if if we don't see um, that um, we we are bringing in diverse panels to to offer out to our applicants um, that opportunity for again for them to see themselves across from that table, then we need to push back a little bit 
um, and invite additional people or um, ask questions about um, what are you what are you looking for and what do you need um, at the table as far as experience as far as diversity um, and, and I, I appreciate that because sorry thank you I appreciate yeah. that because um, I, you just mentioned Mr. McCall and his work <laughs> with the hard work that you all are doing and and from what I've seen and it looks exceptional and and Mr. McCall out there you know pushing and doing work and being creative and and, and reaching out um, I would hate for that to be for naught if um, these behaviors aren't disrupted and mm -hmm. if it's still coming back and principals um, are hiring based on the charts that you just showed me the same way it's been since 2018 then it really you know you're doing the work but those behaviors are still there they're not being disrupted and someone is not overseeing that or being more involved in it I don't see those um, behaviors changing. I, I mean, I'm optimistic, but I I, I also am a pragmatist and I'm just looking at human human. No, I, I, sure, I, I hear you. I, I think we would we would also have to though stand that up um, against the diversity of the applicant pool. Mm -hmm. So um, I, 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 I think we have to. We would have to be careful about making an assumption that um, the data looks the way that it does because um, a candidate of color was deliberately not selected. So I, I think I, we don't have enough data on the slides that we've shared to, to really look at it across um, the whole continuum. There are many yes. facts that go into it. Yes, so there are, I, and I'm not saying yeah. that. What I'm, that's why I've asked. No, I, do, I, 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 I knew you were, I just didn't want, um, I didn't want anyone else to make that assumption because I knew that that was not that was not what you were implying. Yeah, that's not what. I, what I, but that's why I asked for you all to come back right. um, after the printing, so then we will mm -hmm. have the um, <laughs> applicant pool uh -huh. with which to look at and observe and and see. Because I, I I just you know I'm curious. I'm I like to look at the numbers and compare and uh -huh. uh, see what's there. So. Thank you. It looks like there is a question from Ms. Jose. Yes, thank you. So Ms. Lowry, who decides who's on the panel and uh, where does that panel, the composition, where do they come from? Is it HR mm -hmm. and who develops the scoring criteria based on different jobs? Mm -hmm. um, if you could just explain that quickly. Sure. So um, again, it it depends upon the particular job, just as you indicated. So um, when an, an interview panel um, comes forward, it's going to Mr. McCall or it might be going um, to one of the other officers or managers. Um, the panel is um, is reviewed um, for, as far as um, a number of factors um, looking at diversity by race, um, gender, ethnicity, experience, et cetera. And it's really taking a look at the, the job at hand. Um, you know, Mr. Dixit, for example, is going to have a very specified job that he's, you know, looking for somebody um, who is an architect, et cetera. So he's going to have to have people at the table that know that job well enough to be able to say whether or not the individual across from the table has the skill set to perform that job. So um, it's no different than if you're hiring for somebody in the field of mathematics. You want people at the table that know the job, but at the same time, you want um, people at the table that are bringing um, multiple perspectives to being able to evaluate that it, the, the individual applicants that are coming to the table, that they know um, the content that you're interviewing for. So there are a variety of factors that go in. There's a, um, a scoring tool that um, uh, comes out of you know, the responses that they're giving to those questions. And um, there's always a member of HR um, on, on those level of, of interview panels just to make sure that we are maintaining continuity of practice um, and that the um, interview is conducted appropriately. Thank you, Ms. Jose. Were there any other questions? 
No. OK. All right. Thank you all so very much for the presentation. That was exceptional and um, I'll definitely be looking forward to um, to the uh, follow up with that to hear and see the data and everything. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. So it looks like um, the last item on the agenda is announcements. Our next equity committee meeting will be held Thursday, August 18th, 2022 at 4 p.m. Look, look and um, and I'd like to know if there's any further business and it looks like there's a question or comment from Ms. Jose. Yes, Ms. Scott, I don't know if you would be doing the agenda setting now or with Mr. Handy later. I'd like uh, to do it at the end of the meeting. Yep, uh, so if there's um, any further business like for our next meeting that you'd like to see. Yes, I would like on the agenda to if Mr. Handy and his group could bring forth some kind of research on measures and policies that have been implemented and used in other school districts on anti-racism. OK, measures and policies on anti-racism that have been used in other school districts, uh, statewide, nationwide, any preference? Um, you know, a couple maybe statewide and nationwide. I don't know. I've seen a few implemented uh, nationwide, but a couple from state if we have any and a couple from nation would be good. Good examples uh, for the committee to discuss. Okay. All right. And I wanted to see if we could. Um, oh, yes, there's a comment from Mr. Thomas. Oh no, Ms. Scott, please go first. Oh sure. Um, actually, I was going to say um, I wanted to see, and I thought this was a great idea. Um, something at, at um, as far as having some feedback on how we had implemented the school system is implementing some of the presentations that we've had, and I was going to ask Mr. Thomas to because um, I actually he had actually mentioned it before, and I thought it was a, a great idea. Um, but you know we've had great presentations, um, and just actually it would be good to see how they're how you all are implementing them in the school system. So for instance, like the posters that. Uh, went out, you know, how that's being implemented, where and what, and um, just so that we know the things that we're doing here are how they're actually being um, reflected on the on the ground level. Um, in addition to the presentation um, that we had like today, and we're going to hear later on how that's being implemented, but some of the others that that were done. Um, as far as uh, the one that was done last, um, I think it was last month, um, just how that's being. I, I'll let Mr. Thomas go ahead if you can, because <laughs> I think you said sure. it very well. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that that covers a lot of it, especially like uh, we had discussed the non-discrimination of LGBTQ plus students and activities, things like that. We talked about an LGBTQ plus manual that was being adopted, so I'd love to see that more. I know where there's a lot of conversation about gender neutral bathrooms and Mr. Handy, we've been in contact a little bit, but my term's coming to an end now, so I'd love to see, be able to come back and look at a meeting and be able to uh, maybe hear an update about that. Um, just looking through some of the other meetings, I, some of my notes that I had, um, we had talked about uh, a, n a number of other things. So kind of like a, a, a recap of, of the things we've discussed this year and kind of since we discussed them last, since we had a presentation, you know, what's been done since, how have the conversations in this committee uh, actually gone into some of the work in our school system? That's really what, what I would love to see. That's great. Thank you. Oh, and uh, some of the presentations also that the count that we had from the council. Mm, um, yes, yes, actually, yes, yes. and because they gave us recommendations and especially the one about um, our, our refugee students. Um, yes, especially in about today's society uh, with everything that's happening in Ukraine. Um, just an update on we're kind of where did that conversation go and how has that been uh, integrated into the work that we're doing? Yeah. And my other comment was about this being my last board meeting. And so I just wanted to thank everyone in this committee for all the work we've been doing all year. This has been one of my favorite committees. Um, I it, it, it this committee is probably the committee where I've learned the most about our school system on the board. And I think 
the Equity Council is going to continue to grow and thrive in, in future years. I hope this committee continues to grow and thrive um, now that it's, I think this is the second year that this committee is even with our Board of Education. So um, it's been an honor working with you all. And this is technically actually then my last official board meeting, committee meeting too. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Christian, and we will certainly miss you and your input and um, <laughs> everything that you brought to the equity um, committee. Uh, you brought a great perspective and one that that was needed. So I am very honored, very happy that you chose to join us and share your voice and experiences with us so that we can grow and and be better. So thank you. Um, the only other thing I'd add is also Lastly, um, if we could have talk about or discussion on doing another equity audit. Um, as I understand, audits are done usually every three years, and the last one was done in 2020, I believe. So just the feasibility of doing another one, because that one was done pre-COVID. So doing an equity audit post-COVID, I think would, would, would be necessary. Okay, is there any any further business? Okay, all right, hearing Mr. none. Well, I'm Mr. Sorry. Handy had a comment in the chat. I don't know. If I'm sorry, Mr. Handy. Oh, that's okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thomas. Thanks, thank you, Ms. Sure. Scott. Uh, well, number one, first I just wanted to, um, I took notes on what uh, committee members have shared, so thank you very much. Um, I will do some follow-up. I did want to start with Ms. Scott's last request. Um, Ms. Scott, I just went through the it's the expanded document. I need to check to make sure it's online, but it's. I got a copy from DRAA, so I already did some highlights um, of areas that I'm looking forward to being getting some updates on. But I'll be working with my um, fellow staff members this summer to start compiling that because I know they'll need some lead time. So hopefully, I'll have that for you all um, early in our meeting uh, cycle for this uh, next school year. And I made notes of the other requests um, from Ms. Joe's and um, Mr. Thomas has some updates. So let's make sure I took some notes. I will be doing some follow-up on that. So thank you all for getting us started for next school year. Uh, council is planning, so I think you'll like what they come forth with once um, those meetings start. I think we're excited about that. And just lastly, want to uh, congratulate Mr. Thomas on, congr on graduation, wish him well at Yale University. Yeah. Um, looking forward to seeing what he does next. Um, but I, I agree, Ms. Scott, I think he brought great energy to to um, to our committee. Uh, I think he helped pace us at times, um, and really just appreciate and a lot of follow up. And Mr. Uh, Thomas, I did not forget. I know, like I said, I am actively working on uh, the, the, the gender neutral bathrooms along with fellow staff. So the disaster that you give me some time to to move things forward, uh, but I, I I think we're moving in a good direction based on what this committee set forth. I really appreciate the committee saying, right, like how has the work actually impacted the system? I really love that framing that you all put to it. So um, certainly we'll be working to compile something and bring back to you all when we uh, reconvene. So, um, and want to thank the committee overall as well. And congratulations again, Mr. Thomas. Yes, <laughs> we will miss you. All right, thank you so much. And um, is there any further business? All right. Hearing none, then the meeting is now adjourned. And I thank you all so much for joining us. I hope everybody has a good evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, thank everyone. You. Yeah. Bye.